Hi, everyone. Welcome to a discussion about having a relationship to Pluto, um, as in the archetype, um, but I suppose also the planet. Um, my name is Sabrina Monarch, and I am an evolutionary astrologer. I write weekly forecasts at monarchastrology.com. And what I have to speak about today is pretty informal. I've come up with a list of topics, and I'm just going to speak to them and invite you to have a dialogue with me. Um, so that means some questions at the end, as well as anything that comes to mind during, feel free to write something in the chat box. Um, and we can have a discussion. So I wanted to open with um, a description of Pluto that I came across just the other day. Um, it's in this book called um, Journey Work of the Stars by Rosie Finn. And she's an astrologer um, who's very talented in Olympia, Washington, that I used to work with um, when I lived there. Um, and just really appreciate her perspectives. Um, but she writes in this book um, a short description of Pluto, which I thought was beautiful. Um, it starts with universal law. Everything is evolving. Everything is changing all of the time. Pluto rules death in the underworld, but make no mistake. Pluto wants us to live, live life to the fullest. Pluto wants us to taste all the riches of the world, but without attachment. Pluto wants us to understand that we are just visiting and life is short and tenuous. Pluto reminds us that death is right around the corner, so live now. Experience everything. Let go of anything that gets in the way. Pluto actually has purpose and intention. He does not long for suffering or misery. Those are old notions of hell. Pluto wants us to lose the attachments that are creating suffering in our lives. Pluto is all about alleviating suffering and showing us how we are creating our own suffering. Pluto wants us to take this life seriously, wants us to appreciate being given a body. It isn't always easy to get one, you know. Pluto helps us unload our burdens, helps us to stop taking on so much baggage. You can't take it with you, is Pluto's motto. Um, so I just really appreciated that. Um, very short way of getting to know the archetype of Pluto and to consider it as um, the alleviation of suffering, where when a lot of us are having Plutonic experiences, um, they can feel hellish. We can feel like we're really deeply suffering. And to work with Pluto and have a relationship with Pluto is to understand this really deep force that is very unavoidable. It is, you know, it makes up this undercurrent or deep, um, subterranean realm of our experience and so if we have a problematic relationship to it or aren't really friends with Pluto it's harder to deal with Pluto transits and the plutonic experiences that we end up having um, so one piece um, that I guess I'll start with when thinking about Pluto is that we're really considering what is at the root of things or the bottom line which means that anything that's happening on the surface of our lives, um, so the trunk of a tree and all of its branches, they're coming from a certain root place. And you can expend a lot of energy and you know, emotional energy working with the branches and the trunk, and still the same problems keep cropping up in different forms um, if the root itself is not addressed. Um, I think people experience this um, pretty readily, or I might be biased because I'm a Venus Pluto aspect person, um, but in terms of relationship, where you may attract the same kind of partner even though it's in different people um, until some kind of psychological growth occurs and you start attracting an entirely different kind of partner. Pluto, um, and it comes up in evolutionary astrology too, this kind of philosophy that. Um, we are not victims, like Pluto really asks us to take accountability for the depths of our lives, um, to take accountability, and Pluto's also in Capricorn right now, so here's that like filter, and I've also have to reflect on having learned of Pluto in the deep way that I know of it now, you know, I didn't really look at Pluto before five years ago, um, I've always known Pluto while it's in the sign of Capricorn, 
So of course, I think a lot about accountability and soul level accountability. Um, but being accountable for the kind of magnetism that you have and the consequences of that magnetism. And so that can be maybe annoying or difficult at first, and then it becomes increasingly rewarding because you gain more and more agency in life. Um, and why I thought about talking about having a relationship to Pluto um, as an astrologer, as an evolutionary astrologer, is that your ability to empower other people, like to empower your clients, is directly in relationship to your own magnetic field and your own spiritual process. Um, and interestingly, too, like helping other people or becoming a better astrologer and working with clients will also help you grow and evolve. Um, just like a parent that has a child um, will come up against certain resistances or things um, that they need to work on because of this relationship, our human relationships in whatever form or roles that they take um, help us meet and transform our limitations. So it's not really, I guess, in like the Pluto world, you're not trying to stay the same or just reach some kind of pinnacle of you know, spiritual realization and then you can help people. You actually move through life and help others by helping yourself. Um, and they're very intertwined. Um, and I think that this can come up, um, people won't do the work, I guess, that they feel deeply called to do because they don't feel ready. Um, but Pluto um, is like, where's the edge? How do you um, become ready um, by being just like in the experience. Um, I'll come back to that point later. Recognizing a Pluto process in yourself has to do with your um, deepest resistances and deepest desire. Um, so it's this double edge of your own experience um, where on the one hand, there's this stuff that is taboo and really off limits and you just don't want to go there and then there's the stuff that you want really badly um, deep desires and then sometimes they even kind of bleed over into each other like you want something so badly that you can't even stand to look at it or think about it because it hurts that you you want it that bad um, and this can be I guess some misconceptions that we have around desire and also just the the weirdness of being alive in this form. I think about um, what we are and like what nature is. Um, only in the last year have I started to think of Pluto as nature. I thought of Jupiter as the archetype of nature and that Pluto is like the soul in the underworld. And then in taking this philosophy program that I've been in in San Francisco um, at CIIS, I've learned a lot about um, the archetypal cosmology perspective of Pluto being nature, and also have been um, absorbing the teachings of Brian Swim, who teaches the universe story and the way that um, the wisdom lineage that he's a part of talks about the you know, birth of the universe and that living inside of us, um, that we're not these separate, you know, truncated beings that we actually hold the origin of the universe inside of us, which includes this like bursting, flaring forth, you know, intense um, stars being born and dying, and that there's this increasing complexity and evolution. Um, for example, one of the um, like really beautiful poetic insights that Brian Swim had brought up um, was that the earth um, is constantly hurling around the sun and it's not just like this casual kind of thing. If you think about how much they weigh and how intense it is that they're able to orbit each other in that way, um, he does a better job at rendering that than I am in this moment. But he was saying that what holds them together, you know, it's gravity, but there's this kind of eros within gravity. There's this deep attraction to the earth, um, between the earth and the sun. Yet that relationship is not consummated. They have this distance between them. Yet the sun 
infuses the earth with light and the earth responds to that by creating, you know, these first like these one cell organism and slowly more and more complex organisms. We have um, plants that develop the ability to receive sunlight and turn it into energy. And so you have through plant life, an example of the consummation of the love between the earth and the sun. And then you have, you know, animals, you have mating, um, you have this beginning of sexuality, um, and then you have the human and our very intense um, eros and love nature and desire nature. And how the, that's not just some kind of random, you know, human experience, it's actually nature moving through us. Um, I also had the pleasure of seeing Lynn Bell give a talk at Norwalk this year um, called Eros and Scorpio. And she brought up um, this point as well around how emotions um, are like nature moving through us. Um, I have to find this Hillman quote that she brought in, but it was something about how we have to go where the arrow falls. Like there's this pull, there's this draw, and sometimes we're just so caught up in it and we have to go um, to where we're being called. That's plutonic. I think there's a teleology in our experience and how we understand kind of where we need to go and where we're pulled in this life can often come to us through the language of desire. And we have such a strange relationship to desire historically as a human species. Um, Desire is how we entered this portal of existence um, in most cases. And yet it's so like there's also this force in human history and human consciousness. Um, maybe we can compare it to the archetype of Saturn where we really try to control um, our experience of desire or we negate it or say like, that's wrong. I shouldn't do that. I'm supposed to do this. And the soul kind of fractures in those moments. Um, it's like living a life that you don't really align with, that you don't really derive any pleasure from. What does that do to the soul? It, it kind of has to shut off or it gets distorted. Um, we say in evolutionary astrology, what gets repressed gets distorted. And that's what we're working with when we look at Pluto in a natal chart um, is what kind of desire nature is here. It will often relate to certain talents and gifts. Um, due to the nature of Pluto's focus and you know, what focus does to a person over time, as well as the nature of how we have repressed things um, or what kinds of complexes we have due to our particular desire nature. Anyway, though, when it comes to recognizing your desire and having a relationship to it, I think that's part of how we work with the Pluto archetype consciously in our lives. It's considering that there might be a valuable teleology toward desire nature and that we have this way where we can facilitate it where we can get out of the way in terms of not blocking what our desires are and then you know we do have to complexify our character um, and our certain you know skillfulness of living because desire it's not just about you know acting on how you feel all the time regardless of other people or you know, natural law and things like that, there's um, a certain balance or synergy that is needed um, when it comes to living in accordance with desire. Um, and that's actually another principle within Pluto is mutually symbiotic relationships, um, energy exchange, exchanges of power, and how we go about doing that. Thinking about Pluto archetypally and having this relationship to Pluto since I got into evolutionary astrology, um, set up this continual meditation that we're always exchanging energy. That, you know, when it comes to even eating food, I'm uh, like taking in the energy of that food and everything that created that food, including the sun um, and all the people that were involved in, you know, harvesting the plants, etc. And that turns into energy in my body, which allows me to live. And that exchange is something that we're doing pretty much all the time. It's one of the laws of how we exist here in this form. This can have to do with um, 
really figuring out deeply in your own value system and your own character how it is you want to be in meaningful exchange with other people and how maybe you want to receive um, help with the areas that you don't that you feel limited Pluto is about expanding past our own limitations and helping others to do so so when you offer your particular gifts and talents into the world or in relationship to others you're helping empower them you're helping them expand past their limitations and some of us are more comfortable doing that you know it feels better to maybe help others um, but it can go both ways such as when you receive help um, you're giving someone else the opportunity to act on their gifts and um, that can be meaningful too um, another thing to think about with Pluto is um, deep attraction and deep repulsions. And the confusing nature that sometimes they're both wrapped up together, like I was saying earlier, that you want something so bad it hurts. Um, so how do you know if you're attracted to or repelled by it? And why are people scared of their destiny or scared of the things that they want the most? One um, piece of it, I think, can have to do with um, how deeply personal and sharp Pluto is as an archetype, and just how, as we evolve, even throughout one lifetime, we gain the faculties to handle Pluto, you know, in a different way than we necessarily have when we're younger. Um, so I think a lot of, you know, even if we just look at the natural zodiac wheel and see the combination of Scorpio and Aquarius, Scorpio being the ruling sign um, or under Pluto's rulership, um, there's this connection between deep desire and like the soul and trauma or fracturing Aquarius and dissociation. Um, I think that when we touch Pluto and we actually find ourselves merging with desire, like you end up experiencing something you've desired for years but never had, you can expect like fractured or dissociated parts of yourself to actually come back on board. How do we integrate that? How do we really align with that? I think um, that's part of the work. <laughs> I'm still coming up with answers to that too and something that I often will explain to people in readings when I'm looking at their chart and can see those um, like places in the chart that represent fracturing. Um, it's like when stuff starts to get better or you start to move closer in alignment with your higher self, with your destiny, be prepared to feel like parts of you are coming back online. Um, when you're not in touch with those things, um, dissociation can occur. Um, and this, you know, we might see this in the signature too of Pluto squaring the lunar nodes. When I've meditated on that, I think about someone who's had some ego incarnations where they couldn't actually integrate their soul into their personality. Um, and that could be related to maybe some kind of deep, you know, circumstantial restriction in their life, um, like really intense, like an authoritarian regime, or, you know, some kind of, um, I don't know, like being in prison or something in a past life. And you're in a place where you can't express your soul through your personality. What do you do? You know, you dissociate and detach. So in this lifetime, when we have certain desires, I think there's different voices in different parts of ourselves that's like, yes, you know, go for that. Make your life happen. Get in alignment with that stream of intensity um, and this like teleology and the universe expressing itself through you. Or that's scary. Don't do that. Um, or you can't do that, or you're not allowed to do that. And working with Pluto and having this, um, maybe a devotion or intention to really honor your desires and listen to them strikes me more as having like a stewardship relationship to your incarnation. The soul, Pluto, speaks in terms of desire. So you'll have this deep inkling or deep draw that the ego doesn't necessarily know how to interpret or understand. And you have the ability with your ego to judge your desire and to squish it and be like, no, not going to do that. Um, or you can actually facilitate it. And when you do, 
um, and you enter this kind of plutonic way of being, um, that I feel like is what having a relationship to Pluto entails. And it requires that you evolve. Um, not listening to your desire can be a way to keep things the same, to remain in homeostasis. Um, but it can also be letting the reality that ar is around you and other people's desires and, you know, society's desires, um, historical patterns to create the tracks of your life and to actually honor, meditate on, consider, you know, analyze what you want is to instead enter an individuation path and um, move forward as a soul. Um, then the challenges that come up with that, um, one thing with Pluto to really consider, hold on, is um, the process of entanglement. So we're energetically merged with things all of the time, um, even just that for most of us, we're usually experiencing ourselves in a body like this body. Um, some people have out of body experiences, etc. But for the most part, you have this kind of um, attachment to this perspective, you have access to your own memory. Um, and Pluto relates as well to addictions. Um, so this can be a psychological kind of addiction, you have a pattern of thinking, which could be reinforced in this life. Um, and you can track the threads that way. Um, and it can also be karmic and further um, in a like reincarnational timeline that this lifetime has simply continued to recreate. Um, if we don't have self-awareness, like Pluto really helps us become more deeply self-aware, like always peeling back layers. Um, if you take things at face value or take it for granted that this is just the pattern of my life, this is, um, you know, I attract this kind of relationship, this is um, the level of happiness and well-being that I'm accustomed to, um, you can just continue to, to recreate that. Um, and then physical addictions, you know, also are something that maybe um, we can wrap our minds around in a, a slightly more tangible way. Like um, if you have some kind of substance addiction, or even if you're just addicted to a particular kind of food um, or sugar or something like that, it's like you're compelled to keep enacting out that addiction. Um, and I relate this to the concept of entanglement as well, because um, when you're physically addicted to something, your body responds to that addiction with confusing signals that make you feel like that's what you need, even though it might not be what you need. Um, entanglement on a more psychic level um, is like being attached to concepts or themes and not knowing that you are. Um, one example I was just saying um, yesterday in a different talk was that um, if desire is the root of suffering, and you've heard that before, um, it's not really desire itself that causes people suffering. Desire is like fire and it can be exciting and um, opening and like enlivening. But the experience of wanting or of lack, if you're experiencing the entanglement with that, um, you can be fixating and obsessed with not having something and that might be more painful you know, or the sense of impotence or like that you can't do something that can be more painful than desire itself. And so we're getting very specific and very aware when we look at Pluto. Um, but there can also be entanglements in the form of like your self-esteem and your self-image. If you've had a lot of experiences in life um, of being like abused or mistreated, not having really great opportunities, you might have your sense of self-worth, your sense of self entangled with all of these negative experiences. And Pluto, um, as we work with that archetype, can be really about letting go and paring down um, these attachments that um, many of them we just don't want to have anymore. Pluto's 
also really about the process of transformation and transmutation. And I found Pluto and like Pluto based astrology at a time in my life where I really wanted to, I guess, like belong in the world and have a way of aligning my passions and talents with something that I could you know, do as a career. Um, but I was very anxious and not sure if that was even really possible. And yet I also believed in some of these esoteric principles and magic and started to, you know, I had this really like beautiful, I feel like a year where I just didn't have that many responsibilities and I had a lot of spaciousness. And so I would um, do a lot of consciousness experiments. Like I would find that um, if I really wanted like um, to feel something or to have a certain kind of experience, if I was focused on wanting it, it wouldn't happen. And if I started to do something or enter a state of consciousness where I felt like I'd already arrived and like I already was happy, my environment would start to reflect that. Um, and that was just really cool to be able to see that and to begin to shape a relationship between my internal space and my external karma. Um, but I started to, during that time, realize that to consciously transform, there's like three different things you can do. Um, one is that you can let go of something and just like however you release something or let something go, um, which in of itself is actually pretty hard to do. Um, you can think of it too like in terms of physical addictions, it's like quitting smoking or quitting sugar, just cold turkey. It's pretty hard. Um, the other thing would be to um, move towards something else, to form a bond or an attachment um, to an idea, for example. Like you could be really thinking about abundance and well being and start to consciously merge and focus with that idea. And the other thing, is that you can do both at the same time. So if you're going to um, loosen up an addiction in your life, whether it's physical or emotional, what are you going to not necessarily replace it with, um, but what are you going to add into your life that resonates with your values instead and helps you move forward? Um, an example of replacing it, though, would be like if you were... Um, you know, just something that doesn't actually level you up. You're just kind of um, replacing one addiction for another. Um, so be aware of that. Um, focus is also a deep um, Pluto theme. And becoming aware of the way that we're always focusing on things, even if the focus has become embedded in kind of a background thing. Um, so if you are, you know, whatever you're focusing on, you tend to add into your gravitational field um, and your magnetic field, and Pluto relates to our magnetism in that way. So if you're focusing on all your problems or just like how bad of a person you are because you have all these problems, um, it's really hard to actually transform them. Um, versus if you start to focus on, say, like your gratitude um, or how far you've already come, or like how supported you are by the universe and you start to you know, form these different ways of focusing, you can more quickly evolve and experience, I guess, less pain um, on the route to transformation and actually experience um, a lot of joy. And I have um, moon Pluto aspect, so my moods tend to be Plutonian and I just have a general emotional practice of you know, and I feel like I'm really moody and I don't know why, finding out what makes me feel better. And so I'm always gaining these new ways to be self-aware around what creates happiness for me. Before I knew about Pluto and was really into astrology, my moods would spiral um, and I would be depressed for, you know, long spans of time. Um, and it would take things getting kind of bad like Pluto intensity to kind of snap out of it and switch directions. Um, so it can just be a really useful like ally and resource um, to be aware of 
how to change your energetic attachments and focus um, and to use that to propel yourself forward. Um, yeah, rather than spiraling downward. Um, another thing that has just come to mind that I hadn't written down before um, is trust. Pluto is majorly about trust, and it can be about trust that we have um, with other people. It can be the trust we have in our own intuition, our own knowing. Um, and it's also trust that we have in the universe itself. Um, again, like focus, I, there's something deeply esoteric about focus. And so I really advocate for people to use their focus with a lot of agency and consciousness and even cleverness. Um, but I remember, you know, I've had various times in life um, where I have anxiety, um, especially before I found like a much deeper kind of rooting in my spiritual path and in astrology. Um, there was a time where I was like very scared about what was going to happen in the world. And the insights that have been the most meaningful um, spiritually to come out of that and in meditation was to instead of worrying about things that are out of my control and getting energetically attached even and wrapped up in these um, like storms of chaos and fear um, to meditate on being at the right place at the right time to listen to my intuition um, and to form a relationship to that kind of sense of luck being at the right place at the right time. Um, it works. It's really cool. Um, I got this sense. Um, I've had, you know, if you have ever been in an emergency situation where things worked out at the right time or you woke up from a nap at just the right time to act um, in a moment of emergency um, or you just, you know, your phone was on silent and you somehow knew to look at it and someone was calling and it was a really important phone call. There's these other kind of deeper subterranean threads of communication and like a web that we're all a part of that I think Pluto really relates to. And when you're unconsciously obsessed or attached or fixated on something, um, or even consciously, you're engaging in a certain web and you have like these tethers and cords to that experience. Um, and that, that keeps people kind of bound in a sense. What has been really interesting to reflect on with Pluto-based astrology is that we really emphasize in terms of this school of astrology in comparison to other forms, um, which I still need to become more educated on other forms to speak um, better on this topic. But what I have kind of um, intuited is that our perspective on fate is that we have like a lot of agency in that. What, what fate is um, in the Pluto perspective is being unconscious. And so because you're unconscious, you're more pulled by these tethers that you have to forces that you don't know you're connected to. And similarly, in like ancient astrology, like fate and the gods, like they were kind of pulling the strings and you were, um, you were in that. But if you reach some kind of spiritual consciousness and elevated yourself out of that, you were able to have more of a hand in your own fate. That type of thinking is still here. In this form, it has more to do with having more agency um, and self-awareness and changing your energetic tethers. Um, Pluto and Neptune have a special relationship. Um, you know, Neptune being this unitive um, force, it relates to source um, in evolutionary astrology. And Pluto is like the specific wave that comes out of source. It's um, you know, and then the incarnations that we have in our lunar self is like um, another aspect of that wave. Um, but it all ultimately comes back to Neptune. But Pluto is this emergent kind of um, 
thing that propels us out of that oceanic space. Um, so they are deeply connected. There is this kind of mystical connection between our instinct, um, between our soul, and you know the oneness and spirituality. And with that, we also have the ability to use our focus and our intensity, our soulfulness to connect to our spirituality and our spiritual path. You can use your focus as a form of prayer. Um, you know, you can pray to align your intuition and your instinct with your dharma and like with what you're here to do. You can pray um, to be more receptive to spiritual insights and to have, um, you know, an understanding of how to proceed in life. Those are um, desires and impulses, Pluto, towards union, Neptune. Um, and yet, um, you can be entangled with thinking like, oh, I'm just not that spiritual or I'm not that creative. Um, and you're actually willing that to some extent um, with your consciousness. And I think that it can seem really radical or really strange that you can actually just use your focus to change your reality. And one that I thought was really interesting, I was reading these lectures um, of a spiritual teacher and his students. And one of the students was asking like, so I get these rules and the way that you're explaining the universe works, but why? Like, why are we here? And the teacher said back, um, you know, why are we here? Like, the, you are the universe, so think about it and start to access your knowing until it feels more and more, um, like, real. Like, he was saying almost like pretend that you know until you actually know. Um, and I just thought that that was humorous and it was like such a shortcut where it's like sometimes we think that we have to do all these things to become worthy or to become ready and those processes um are important and they can um add magnetism or add gravity or actually alchemically shift a person um, but sometimes there is that like subtle ability to just shift things to say you know, I've never identified as a creative person, but today I'm going to pretend that I am creative until it becomes real. Um, so I think that that comes up too in terms of accessing our, um, our intuition and just the things that we desire. Like if we're getting in our own way with having concepts and entanglements with beliefs and emotions that contradict our desire nature or, you know, what's wanting to come through us, um, there's a lot more of this kind of push and pull. One thing um, that I have gotten to reflect on just in considering Scorpio, um, which we associate with Pluto um, in the like modern rulership, but Scorpio um, to the ancients was ruled by Mars. And so Scorpio still can hold that kind of dual rulership and it creates, um, if you add Mars and Pluto together, you have, you know, ice, Pluto, and it's water that can change forms. So it can be um, liquid, um, it can turn into a gas, it can freeze, it has that quality within its archetype. And Mars is just heat. Um, and so when we're enmeshed or kind of swirling around our like scorpionic plutonic process sometimes i think of it being actually pretty like steamy like there's a lot of energy and fight and fire in it which can relate to the kind of resistance um of like oh like i can't do that i you know i want that i shouldn't and just this kind of um mixed signals and mixed impulses or the will and a person's kind of um active nature can be in alignment and in agreement and in harmony with Pluto, its higher arc octave, which would be, um, you know, someone that has this like a, a deep desire and moves towards it. Um, how they discover to get out of their own way, how they discover to empower and uplift themselves. There's a lot of, um, 
I feel like experience a, like this concept around like not wanting to be selfish, like it's wrong to be selfish. And I think that that's confusing towards the incarnational, you know, spiritual path because we are um, experiencing ourselves as centers. Something that I thought was really, you know, that I got to learn in school this year um, that was profound to consider was that um, it's called this, you know, cosmological power of centration, which is that um, there are many points in the universe that experience themselves as centers. Um, so each person, for example, is like a center. They're experiencing reality with themselves at the center. And the universe is supporting all of those to happen simultaneously. If you've ever noted really profound synchronicity in your life um, and wondered like, how does the cosmos orchestrate such like majesty for my own you know, personal theme? Um, it's awe-inspiring. And yet it does that for multiple people, you know, for everyone. Um, and we're all kind of in that web of it together. So self-denying or like denying the magnificence of your incarnation, of your soul, um, by not listening to what's pulling you forward, um, tends to create pain and cataclysm at moments where all of that energy erupts. And so we can have Christ, um, basically from the Pluto archetype, when um, the volcanic energies that Pluto represents come to the surface through you know, it's just time, like it's pent up, um, or something external happens that triggers it. If we make a more consistent habit of listening to this really deep part of ourselves and integrating it into our personality and into our actual lifestyle choices, when intense things happen, we might have more familiarity with how to navigate them. And I think we also kind of let the steam out so we're not just pressure cookers. Um, I think things like um, like health has a certain resonance where if you think about um, not every choice you make for your health feels good or is exciting at the moment. Maybe if you have some kind of workout regimen um, or even like yoga, like something that I love doing, it's not always like there's these challenges that come up in it or there's difficult postures or things that bring you to your edge. Um, and if you are always avoiding your edge, you know, and trying to stay homeostatic, things um, that interrupt that seem a lot more traumatic. Um, and you also, there's this kind of life force that doesn't get to be expressed versus when you do something that, you know, you're actively transforming. So whether it's some kind of psycho spiritual emotional thing or you're transforming your body. Um, but if you're actively engaging Pluto and knowing what it's like to change and how to actively change, um, I think the rest of life almost just gets a little bit easier in some way, or there's a harmony um, that emerges from that process. Um, I think I will stop here to ask if there's any questions or thoughts. Sabrina, what about the times um, alternating between times of intense self-awareness and other times when there is a slower evolutionary pace, which is more restful? Um, would these be times of yin and yang in your opinion or what? <laughs> um, I think the, the rest and integration is necessary. Um, and I think that it can be like listening to the cycle of how nature wants to express itself through you. Like sometimes we have this drive to actively transform and life is intense and then we get really tired and we need to rest and take a break. Um, I know I felt that way just a couple of weeks ago. I kept getting all these opportunities to do very exciting things that were taking me out of my normal routines. And I kept saying yes until I got a little bit burnt out and would be like, no, no more transformational experiences. I need a minute. Um, and yeah, it's, 
if you do too much Pluto, which I guess I didn't mention, you know, or it's too much Scorpio without the Taurus um, polarity, um, it can be like burning through bridges and not really forming like a healthy cultivated um, attachment or um, homeostasis um, so that you're, you're just kind of tumbling. Um, and that can be destabilizing. Thanks, Sabrina. And just one more question. What about somebody who is approaching a transit, uh, a Pluto transit, and Pluto will be aspecting their chart, many planets in their chart, like a Grand Cross or a T-square or, you know, multiple planets. Um, what advice would you give? Um, it will be unique to the, to each planet involved. Um, but the area, the archetype that that planet represents will be undergoing a deep transformation. Um, so I think Pluto transits are hard, you know, like the, and they can be, you know, great and empowering, but you might almost like anticipate being a different person on the end of it. And to really not try to resist the change that's occurring, but to facilitate it, um, and to get a sense of, you know, what's really wanting to emerge through you, um, to start to let go of things that are no longer serving, um, and to move towards things that have a greater allurement or attraction, is I guess what I would say. And more specific to the, um, the planets, it would just depend on, you know, which ones they are. Um, like Pluto sun, you know, is like a deep, like just change in your essence, um, who you are, um, or like your creativity. Pluto Venus can be about how you relate to others. You might see a shift in your relationships, like certain relationships leaving your life and new ones entering. Um, Saturn can, you know, you could get a deep restructuring of your career, how your life is structured. Um, and a lot of you know, you would be working, like, Pluto's going to bring us to our edge. So with Saturn, it could also be, like, our stuff around shame or restriction and changing those um, themes. So. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Linda. Hi, Sabrina. I had a question. Um, I really like what you did with the square with Aquarius and Scorpio. And um, you talked a little bit about uh, Taurus, the opposition with Scorpio. And what about Leo? Can you say anything about that square with Leo, Scorpio? Sure. Um, so the Leo, Scorpio, I like thinking about the grand fixed cross a lot as well. Um, they all just keep um, influencing each other. I think the Leo part has to do with our light um, and our creativity and the resistance that a lot of people have to shining. Um, there's like even this cultural, like, you know, the person who stands out gets like hammered back down. Um, I'm not quoting the proverb right. I'm like the nail who sticks up or whatever. Um, and this general fear that people have of like, well, who am I to do this? Um, but then also the desire to be great, the desire to be creatively powerful and how there's this mixed signal or mixed impulse. Um, it's also the quality of jealousy and that when we see people who are really shining, um, parts of our soul that are like latent and undeveloped will experience jealousy. Um, and then when we are in our kind of Leo, our solar space, um, part of what can be so strange about that archetype is that you get a lot of attention. Um, and Leo can love attention, but there's also this stickier part of attention where you might receive unwanted attention or you might realize you have to, um, there's some kind of need to share. Like Leo is a lot about generosity and Pluto is about power. Um, and so if you start to amass some kind of power in yourself because you're very bright or very creative, um, there's this natural 
need to find some way to share it. Um, and then there's also, you know, people that like to shine kind of behind the scenes or quietly um, because it's, they're not necessarily looking to take on that kind of very visible role and all of the attachments that come with that. Um, I think a lot too about like if we T-square Pluto to Leo and Aquarius um, and then even add in Taurus. So Taurus can be about survival and, you know, just being here in a body and having nice things and food and um, living in a material way that's in alignment with the soul. Um, Leo Aquarius can, can be around how we, you know, skillfully detach Aquarius versus dissociating. Um, and Leo is like how we're creative, how we play. Um, so, yeah, and I think too, something that I found experientially that really surprised me was that I've been like very interested in intellectual pursuits since I was a kid but I resist them intensely because I thought that I would be lonely. Like the further I got into my intellect, like the worse my life would become was what I thought as a kid. And then cataclysms would occur and I would just study and, you know, do that. And now a lot of my happiness and well-being and friendships and relationships have constellated around um, the things that have come up from studying. And I found that like, I was in this like dark night of the soul and started researching psychology, researching the stuff I was afraid of because I thought it would make me a more serious person. And I found myself like laughing more and like, in, like becoming more Leo-like because I was doing what was in alignment with my nature. And so through that process, I learned that if we actually just are ourselves and are like really embodied in our soul, that we end up being able to have more fun too. Um, and there's also, I think, you know, on the other side of that, how do you, Leo relates to the lights kind of being on or off. It's our brightness, um, our solar field. And that can be in an empowered state, Pluto or disempowered, um, or, you know, some gradient in between. Um, yeah, I think that's, yeah, there's, I could just talk <laughs> forever about that grand square. And I feel like all of the, <clears throat> all of the squares um, have that kind of gridlock where you can just keep going back and forth between them. Thank you, Sabrina. That was above and beyond. What a beautiful answer. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, kind of uh, tagging along to that one, can you speak more on the Taurus, the Taurus opposition? Um, yeah, I think that Taurus relates to our experience of self-esteem and self-reliance. And self-reliance is a little bit of an abstraction. Like there's not um, an actual way to isolate ourselves or to isolate anything. Like everything is in relationship. Um, so I don't really know how to resolve that exactly. It's almost like a gradient of self-reliance. Um, if we're overly attached or enmeshed, there, I think there's certain parts of ourselves that don't get developed. And Taurus is kind of like how we discover our essence or some unique flavor of ourselves. Um, and it can just be enjoyment of the self. And it's about, you know, the values and resources that we have from within. And then very naturally, they become attractive or alluring to others. Um, I think of um, all forms of like business exchange, can feel very Taurus Scorpio, where it's an exchange Scorpio of value, Taurus. Um, and I think of it too in terms of like Pluto and Scorpio processes, like we can be reaching out, like we want to 
merge or form a relationship um, to something outside of ourselves so that we feel a certain sense of self-esteem or self-value. And sometimes life will really support that. Like you have this ample room and like that's where energy is wanting to, you know, direct you. And other times it's like you're reaching out for connection and there's this repulsion field, you know, Pluto can be attractive or repulsive. And at that time, it might be about going back within and finding you know, your own value and your own sense of groundedness so that when you go back you know, to reach out and like, okay, I want to be in this empowering mutual exchange, that the other, you know, whatever that is or whoever, is actually more interested. Um, Taurus is also so much about the body. And I think of that, it's, you know, the physical body, like literally, and then it's also the, the circumstances of our lives. Um, so if there's this concept of like, you know, you can be happy anywhere, like even in a cave, like just go meditate and be enlightened in a cave, that seems to really deny the Torian side of things where it's like maybe a garden or a wardrobe or some like really delicious food actually has some kind of... Um, portal like value where it you know it creates a environment for the soul to thrive within um and so when you're working with pluto or working with scorpio in your lives it's like how can you actually materialize it um which embeds it as part of your environment and helps stabilize the essence or the theme that pluto or scorpio is speaking to thanks Thank you. Um, so I got a message from Linda. Is it okay if I read this? It was like a private. Yes, absolutely. Okay. I just thought I'd just type it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, could you please speak about the evolutionary states in terms of Pluto? So there's consensus individuated and spiritual. Um, I think that I would consider it with entanglement. And so if you're in a consensus state of mind and you're experiencing Pluto process, you might be entangled with the themes um, that the consensus has placed in terms of, you know, how to live or what you should desire. So your version of, you know, living in alignment with your desire might be to have certain status symbols or something. Um, your desires are more enmeshed with the field of what people consider desirable. Um, and individuated, you're experiencing desires that relate to things that empower you to discover who you are um, as an individual. And in the spiritual framework, um, your desires might be about kind of building bridges from heaven and earth, um, doing things that empower and uplift humanity, doing things that empower and uplift the whole earth community and so non-human beings. Um, it could be the energetic attachments or like relationships, not really attachments, that you form to angels, um, guides, God. Um, and yeah, there's a lot more to extrapolate there, but basically. Um, so yeah, I guess we have room for one more question. Okay, um, how about self-awareness? Would you say self-awareness is more Plutonian or would it be more the moon and the moon's nodes? Or just a combination of both? And then there's Mars as well. So we've got the Moon, Pluto and Mars in terms of self-awareness. I think um, they, Pluto and the Moon definitely relate. Um, Pluto is just always kind of deeper and relates to the unconscious. Um, and so there's always kind of more unconscious content that we can work with. Um, but the moon is a filter, you know, it's a, um, and it can relate to our more day-to-day um, -day fluctuations of mood, um, whereas Pluto 
is kind of a deeper current um, that maybe changes in a different fashion than the kind of, you know, day-to-day -day lunar quality. Um, but I have noticed that, like, um, if you just live by the moon and, like, do what you feel like all of the time, that doesn't have that rate of long-term effects. It's a cool skill to learn how to have. Um, what can help is to see what bigger changes you can make in the structure of your life. So it's kind of more of a Saturn thing and see how your moon stays more buoyant. Um, so if you have a job, for example, that you really hate, every time you go into work, your moon, you know, lunar self sinks. Whereas if you put yourself in a better surrounding that was in more resonance with your soul, your moon would kind of be more buoyant. Um, so I think that the moon itself is like a temperature check sometimes. It doesn't always necessarily have the deep kind of primal wisdom that I think you can find in Pluto. Um, but they both, they interact with each other in a meaningful way. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. That brings us to the end of your meeting. So thank you from all of us and we'll see you next time, Sabrina. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sabrina. It was wonderful. Thank, thank you, Sabrina. Always interesting, always informative. <laughs>